Hey guys, welcome to the latest episode of Beyond the Tape, a podcast that focuses on the Australian mountain bike industry and the cool people doing things within it. Um, on this episode, we are chatting with someone overseas, so it's a Beyond Borders episode. Before we jump into who it is, it, uh, this episode is brought to you by Canyon, our new sponsor. They've come on board for a big year. Um, they're helping me out a lot, so thanks so much for those guys for helping out the podcast and keeping us running. If you want to support those guys, jump over to the website, grab one of these 27.5 spectrals, grab a new 29er spectral, grab a sender, and I'll be super jealous. Either way, jump over to their site, order a bike, and get it sorted. The next sponsor is Two Up Bike Co. Those guys do Nova Wheels, Factor Componentry, and the DuPont kind of lube range. So those guys are doing some really cool stuff. They'll have a back of end um, kind of purchasing site done soon. If not, hit up your local store, tell them you want some of those products, and get them to order them through Two Up Bike Co. Third sponsor is NS Dynamics, Australia's premium suspension servicing company they also do olin's dvo custom stuff like um four sprung as well so make sure that you jump over there either order some of that custom stuff or get your suspension running like new the last sponsor for this podcast is huck the world those guys have been doing these tech tees for ages i'm a huge fan of what they do um, use the code beyond the tape 10 and they will help you out and get you a bit of a deal thanks so much to the people that have been using that code it helps us kind of track it and you get a good deal um, michael over there has been frothing on it anyway this let's get to this episode uh, this episode is with um, leo and jack from canyon bikes um, they are the two kind of people behind the new spectral leo being the engineer and Jack being the kind of marketing and kind of salesperson for the bike. Really interesting chat. Go, we go into the design kind of features, how they went about designing that bike, what they kind of wanted to achieve with that bike and how they managed to achieve it. Um, what they've done and, and their philosophy behind the bike is really cool. There's some really good insights there as well. So I'm super stoked on this episode. I hope you guys are too. Um, make sure that once you're done go and check out that new spectral it's sick uh, hopefully getting one in the mail sometime anyway grab a beer grab a water grab a wine grab whatever makes you happy and enjoy the episode it's a good one jack and leo from canyon bikes welcome to the podcast thanks thanks <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit weird jumping straight in after been chatting for a while yeah totally <laughs> <laughs> um could you guys maybe uh, let us know who you are and, and where you're kind of from and, and what you do at Canyon, uh, maybe starting with Leo? Yeah, for sure. So, yeah, I'm uh, I'm from Stockholm, Sweden, originally, and I moved to, uh, yeah, moved to Koblenz in Germany for like four years ago to do my, uh, yeah, my master's thesis project, kind of. And then, yeah, I got a full-time job after that and I've been working as an engineer in the, in the mountain bike gravity R&D team. So, yeah, just developing products and finally they're hitting the markets. <laughs> Is it good seeing your stuff finally hit the market? Oh, yeah, for sure. So this has actually been like a long-time goal of mine to make mountain bikes. So, yeah, somehow last Tuesday was probably the biggest day in my life or something like that. So it's pretty, it's pretty sweet. It's like your firstborn. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> and how about you, Jack? Uh, where do you kind of fit into the, the picture? Um, I'm taking care of the brand and marketing for, for these bikes, but actually this is also my first bike launch <laughs> so, at this level. So um, I worked at Canyon for five years, but um, up until now I've been working in the UK office. And kind of moved okay. from, um, yeah, I guess warranty and technical support through to events coordinator, and then um, and then ended up managing the marketing over there, uh, and then yeah, just literally first of November, I was into this job. Um, had already done a bit of prep and and work in the lead, but yeah, that was the this was the first one for me as well. So yeah, super exciting. So um, good to work with Leo from from the start, and yeah. I guess a really good one to start. Yeah. Just thrown right in the deep end. 
<laughs> a little bit, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, hopefully it went pretty smooth. I think, yeah, we had a bit of a plan and, and no major disasters. And, um, and I mean, the bike's really good, so that definitely helps, makes my job a lot easier. <laughs> yeah, I don't think, yeah. It's pretty hard to make a mince meat of this one, that's for sure. <laughs> So you were you started in the English office and you were there for five years. Just to... that's right, yeah. And I'm still actually based in the UK now. So um, I guess one okay. of one of the advantages of Corona or, or positive outcomes is that working remotely is a little bit more, um, yeah, dialed. I guess so. Mm. Um, yeah, I can take on a lot of the tasks with yeah with the remote working, which is great. So yeah. Before we move on to like the bike and stuff, what is what has COVID been like for you guys? Because, yeah, obviously designing, marketing, selling and producing a product at the moment must be pretty crazy, right? Yeah. Actually, for this bike, it hasn't been a huge issue because, like, yeah, most of the technical stuff was solved before. So it was mainly the last few details. And But, yeah, just in general, working from home the whole year, it's been a bit weird because... Yeah, we're we're kind of a small team, like the Gravity R and D, and we're working super close together. And yeah, I really have like a really sick team spirit and stuff uh, the last few years. And then all of a sudden, everyone starts working from home, and no one was used to it. So it was a little bit like, <laughs> okay, you know, this like spontaneous discussions, which you yeah just ends up with really good ideas that they, it just disappeared. So in the beginning, everyone was kind of like, okay. <laughs> Just yeah. taking off the task list, I guess we're getting into it. So it's been weird. And of course, like not being able to travel as much and stuff has been a little bit boring. But hey, like we said before, I'm not going to complain about the position we're in in the bike industry during this year. Like a lot of people have it a lot yeah. worse. So yeah. yeah, just keep developing good stuff, actually launching some sick bikes and yeah, having a stable stable job in a stable industry is not bad it's pretty damn good isn't it yeah and yeah, how about you sorry continue i was gonna say it's um it's nice to be at like leo said an industry that's that's kind of yeah in a in a good place um so yeah and also nice i don't know for australia but certainly my experience in the uk is that the cycle market well, clearly is growing again and that's really promising mm. as well. Just for the sport in general, it's awesome to see like new riders coming into it, or maybe old riders that have left it alone for a little while, like taking it back up is is yeah really really positive. And um, and yeah, just hopefully, um, I mean, all three of us in this call know mountain biking's fun, but um, it's just trying to convince other people that it's fun as well. So um, yeah, it's yeah really really good place and. I suppose similar to Leo, yeah, working from home, I guess same as everyone else on the planet, is a little bit of an adjustment. But also, yeah, the marketing side, at least I speak from UK experience, that um, we had quite a nice marketing plan and event plan for the year. And, um, yeah, you hit March and you can pretty much throw that in the bin. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, start to figure out what you can do instead. Um, but actually, it's... Um, maybe it sounds a bit weird but it's actually quite fun as a challenge to figure out mm. what you can do with the yeah the limitations so we can't get people together for shooting you can't you can't do events so what you know what can you do to to get the brand out there and and, and help yeah people experience the product or get to know more about it is um yeah interesting challenge for sure so i guess you guys have had new bikes and new product to market right but i was ch chatting with daryl um, our Australian kind of rep and he made a good point of like you can do all the marketing you want but for some bike brands they've got nothing to sell so it's kind of that catch-22 do you want to be the brand at everyone's forefront when you have stock or and market or do you just hold back when until you've got stock it's it seems hard for you guys yeah I guess it's you can certainly do work even if stock's kind of bad to at least do some kind of brand positioning mm. but 100 percent, you're right like it's you're wasting a bit of breath if you if you push a load of stuff and and then you've got nothing actually to yeah to, to give to people um so but we've been lucky this year and that like you said we've actually had a, a ton of launches the, the mountain bike launches have come towards the back end of the year but um 
yeah before i was doing all the bikes um in the uk and and yeah we've had some huge huge launches through the whole year with with stock and everything so yeah overall it's been it's been yeah busy from that side totally been massive mm. it is good it is a good thing to have and i'm touching on like what you said before about people getting back into it and stuff it seems like i was expecting a bunch of bikes to pop up on the second hand market um everyone get into it realize that it's kind of hard still and then just put them back up but everyone just keeps like surely everyone's got a bike by now like it's insane <laughs> you would think yeah, but, right <laughs> but also like mountain biking not just job mountain biking has been so good this year like mm. it's literally kept me sane because that's <laughs> if you just stick around at home like mountain biking is still as good we can always go riding and everyone is at home and go riding. Whereas if you play team sports or I don't know, something mm. else, you just can't do your, can't do your thing. Even here, like if you would do a yeah, skate or BMX, like the skate, skate parks have been close. Yeah, but okay. going, yeah. going out, going out in the woods is always, it's always open. So yeah, it's been a super good year for riding in general. So I guess that's why the, the, the business is going well too, I guess. Yeah, fair point. Yeah, 100%. I mean, they tried to shut down the forest here for three days and it didn't work. So it is a fair <laughs> <Yeah>. point. <laughs> Shocker. I guess technically it, was, yeah, it wasn't allowed here also, I guess, in April or so, but what are you going to yeah. do about it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mm. Anyone's in the UK that you couldn't go a certain distance from home, but you could still use outdoor space. Um, but some of the like really beautiful spots like remote spots the police had like drones out and stuff for yeah. right. crazy yeah get them to film some of our um our bike edits <laughs> <laughs> pinch the, pinch the footage. yeah uh, sure i'll pay the fine but can you please send the footage <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> business cost out comes the card yeah oh, that's so good yeah, you guys have had some weird rules in the UK. Like, I don't, yeah, I can't get my head around what's happening over there. Plus plus Brexit, geez, there's a tangled web of stuff to figure out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but even without Brexit, like, you would imagine that the EU would kind of stick together and follow similar lines through something like this. But, yeah, just like... Germany, UK, and Sweden, you can already see it's completely different in all those three countries. So it's pretty much a mess, I guess. Yeah. And I mean, <laughs> I'm in Australia. Every state is different. <laughs> it's one country and every state has different rules. It's insane. Yeah. Well, let's move on to something a little bit cooler. Yeah, <laughs> please. <laughs> should, should, we talk about, should we talk about the bike? <laughs> yeah, maybe. Is there a new bike now? <laughs> um yeah there's actually two yeah. but let's talk about this one <laughs> yeah dude i couldn't believe it when i got the second press release i'm like Seri-? it was like three days ago you just released that spectral yeah the funny thing is that both are my projects as well like i've done the engineering for both so yeah it's from the, from never having a bike on the market to having two within a week yeah. it's pretty, pretty hectic <laughs> and told you have twins it's amazing <laughs> So what, um, yeah, so the new Spectral, like we'll start with the, the engineering kind of side of things. One of the things that kind of surprised me with, with Canyon and the way you guys have kind of done it is, I mean, the last Spectral, the 27 and a half, that guy, you didn't really do too many running changes on it. Like it got bumped up 10 mil travel last year, but that was through like the shock and the fork and stuff. How come you went down that route of just doing a complete new bike and didn't kind of do running releases? Uh, In the end, it's... Do oh, you want to go, you go? No, you go, Leo. <laughs> I mean, you can only do so much with an existing platform. And uh, even actually bumping up the travel like that is a pretty big change to be able to do within the life cycle, I guess. Mm. And, uh, yeah, I mean... Like we all know, there's been so much happening with trail bikes the last few years. So, yeah, to, to be able to <clears throat> yeah, meet the capabilities of trail bikes today and to even be like 
towards the front end, like to lead that charge a bit, then it was absolutely necessary to do a, mm. almost change everything. Obviously, the like general suspension platform and layout is the same, but yeah, it was just necessary to change everything to to meet the requirements that we wanted for ourselves, and yeah, I'm sure everyone else wants to. So, hundred mm. percent. And was it your kind of job, Jack, in the customer facing role to kind of see what riders wanted and and get those kind of updates? Or how do you go about finding what the market wants? We have like this is probably more at the end to decide, okay. I guess, what direction um, to go in. But I mean yeah, having joined this role, like the amount of survey data and yeah, and those kind of insights that, that the team uses is, is incredible. So um, Leo would explain probably better, but they're, those guys are having to kind of make um, predictions so far ahead of, of when the product goes live um, that it's yeah trying to recognize trends and, and figuring out what's just like a flash in the pan and, and what's, mm. yeah, what's here to stay. Um, so, yeah, I don't know, Leo, when you did what's the time scales for like locking in geometry like it's yeah so normally normally it's i guess mainly the product manager's uh, responsibility to mm -hmm. to do that to know yeah the market trends and developments and stuff but obviously we're all we're all riders and especially for this bike it's kind of made for ourselves right it's what we ride most of the time so for sure a lot of teamwork so designers and engineers and uh, yeah brand and marketing guys like jack are for sure involved but yeah normally it would be the main responsibility of the product manager uh yeah but to yeah like jack said we have to yeah lock things down obviously quite a long time before it hits the market probably about two years which is the reason why it's easy to look like a genius in the commenting boards on the forums <laughs> and stuff, because you have, because you think you can make your decisions today that would end up on the market today, whereas we're shooting moving targets. So, but then again, we have like all the stuff from a few years in advance available to us. So mm. we are also a few years ahead in terms of testing. So yeah, it's always a tricky one, but in the end, yeah, especially for a bike like this we make for ourselves so yeah it's pretty i think this is quite a quite a cool bike because like we launched the sender i guess in august and that's yeah. like that's similar to like a cross-country bike in that you've got kind of a pretty narrow field of what you're trying to make the bike work at and mm. but then if we look at like a 150 mil trail bike like geez the <laughs> the range of use is incredible, <laughs> especially it seems to be getting wider and wider. Like it's, there's kids going crazy on these things. Um, and yeah, jimming around jumps, riding them super hard. And there's also kind of, yeah, more standard trail riders that want their new bike to be faster than their old bike and to climb a little bit better and to be a little bit lighter and be a bit more capable, um, to yeah, get a Strava com or, or knock out 60 K in a better time or whatever they're up to. Mm. Um, and that was quite my side. The, the spectral was always like having been at Canyon for so long. The the spectral since I started was always that bike to do everything. But the trouble is the kind of definition of everything has changed. <laughs> so, yeah. um, yep. and I guess the options open to guys like Leo designing the frame also have opened up. So it's a super interesting product to kind of make something that does so much stuff. Yeah, really, really well um mm -hmm. so yeah kind of a unique um bike in that respect or at least a unique category of bike all the trail bikes that are shooting for a similar thing i guess but yeah yeah it's, it's almost impossible to call something a trail bike now like or or segment them from like let's say the neuron the strive and the new spectral like it's super hard to segment those like even troy raced a neuron at our enduro here on downhill tracks like and won like it's yeah it's that's so, why it must be so hard that's why i just call it all trail bikes like if it's yeah. not a downhill bike and not a cross-country bike it's a trail bike to me <laughs> some magazines aren't happy about it but 
I think we moved yeah. that on the website actually. Like you hit trail and you have all of those bikes in there. Um, just because it is, yeah, it's moving target. It's it's really a wide open. Um, and everyone's like even country to country. Some people, some countries. It's interesting for me learning this now. Is that countries called all mountain like longer travel, and then trail mm. shorter travel. Whereas in the UK, at least, I guess, yeah, kind of all mountain is a bit more mellow. And then trail bikes, trail bike like, like spectral. So um, yeah, really interesting to see the differences. The the cultural differences must be one of the hardest things for you guys to project, right? Like so here in Australia and I'm guessing probably like America and other places where it's all a kind of a a bit of a dick measuring competition when it comes to to travel over usability. So like everyone wants the bigger travel bikes. But then say in Europe, I find that a lot of people want the more usable bikes all around. Is that kind of the reasoning behind the, the one fifty or one sixty mil travels and trying to trying to attack those markets yeah you know I, mean? I would say <laughs> um yeah. and and that kind of yeah those two i mean i kind of alluded to them but those two kind of user groups are at the extreme ends of things so yeah guys really shredding these bikes super hard um versus guys wanting something a bit lighter and and uh and yeah more efficient so we definitely didn't want to um isolate either of those groups with the spectral because it's for so many years been a bike that both those kind of yeah rider groups have really really liked um so yeah having two specs i think was um, or two it's not two specs it's two kind of styles and there's a couple mm. of specs in each one um so may i'll explain it now for the people that don't know so mm-hmm. we have um we have a option with like a, a pike for a 35 mil chassis and a 150 set of 150 mil travel um and a inline shock a little bit faster rolling tires and that's kind of aimed at shaving a bit of weight making the bike the bike's angles a little bit tight um and yeah kind of trying to hit those more classic trail riders i guess and then for the shredders um we have a couple of bikes with a fox 36 up front and uh yeah piggyback shock a little bit burlier tire from our side that kind of offers them something with a little bit more pumped up angles so a little bit slacker um a bit of mm-hmm. high front end and and yeah if you're if you're ripping down in during- and steep descents or or want something a bit more capability then um yeah that's that's kind of the offering which yeah we think should work pretty well bit of a burlier fork chassis with the fox 36 as well so 100 mm, um, and when you get that kind of like mission in r&d leo how do you go about designing a frame around other durability trying to keep it light and trying to match what riders are going to do in such a broad spectrum? Is that hard for you to narrow down? Uh, so actually when that is all defined and everyone has agreed on it, it's not so hard because then the task is pretty clear. It's harder to get to that point when it's clear what the bike is supposed to be and everyone agrees on it. Of course, everyone is not going to agree 100%, <laughs> but when this, like the spec sheet is set, then then the task is somehow, yeah, it's still not easy, but uh, it's a bit more, the path forward is pretty clear. So, yeah, but then as always, like, yeah, just locking down the geometry and the kinematics is pretty nerve wracking because, I mean, every year I think now I, I figured it out, but then next year you're <laughs> like, now I figured it out. Last year I didn't know anything. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so that's maybe the <clears throat> trickiest challenge, especially when you're not just developing a bike for your own preference. You're developing a range of sizes that's not supposed to fit you perfectly, but rather the intended customers and all kinds of body heights and sizes and shapes. So, yeah, that, that becomes a little bit tricky. But in general, uh, yeah, within our little team, in the R&D, we're all kind of pulling in the same direction and riding in the same way. But, yeah, really working on staying open-minded and realize people are riding it in different ways. So, mm. yeah, in the end, it was, not, it was not so hard to agree on the character we wanted. So, yeah, kinematics is maybe more like improvements and fine-tuning of the, of the previous platform, which was already really good in terms of suspension and... Mm-hmm. Yeah, geometry is a bigger step, but it was quite easy to 
to know in the direction we wanted to go and just increase the capability overall, which we pretty much uh, nailed, I think, because, yeah, the bike ride super fun, I think. And then, yeah, like things like weight and stiffness and stuff is more about optimization and mm-hmm. yeah, it's a little bit more abstract maybe, but that's maybe, yeah, maybe more where I can kind of pull it uh myself a bit as an engineer to kind of define that so yeah and like the last spectral was well, is a super poppy kind of playful nimble bike that can handle a little bit more and you tried to kind of keep that in this new bike when you look at redefining the bike but keeping that essence is the kinematics of the suspension more important to keep that kind of playful poppy feel or is the geometry because it's got like a 65 or 64 degree head angle, right? Which is pretty slack. How do you yes. get that? Poppy? So I guess, I guess the suspension is, yeah, is definitely keeping the character in the suspension is keeping a lot of the character of the bike, but also, yeah, things like increasing the stiffness and re- reducing the weight for sure kept that characteristic. And like you said, we've, we definitely wanted to keep that because that's what's so good about the spectral and it's somehow like what the what the name is being related to mm. but obviously making the bikes or like the geometry this much faster by going longer and slacker and stuff kind of it doesn't exactly help that poppy playfulness mm. maybe and also the 29ers either so that's where that's where it got a little bit tricky to balance that out to to really increase the capabilities of going fast and big but yeah keeping that playfulness so yeah i can't tell you all the details (laughs) of course but i think we succeeded uh but yeah that balance was actually not super easy to to dial in so did you ever get to a point where you went too crazy with the geometry? Oh, for sure. I mean, we're not the only <laughs> ones going too crazy. You can just log on to Pink Bike and they're yeah. they're going pretty wild. But yeah, uh, I'm for sure. Like when you work in R and D, literally your job is to be open minded, and you mm-hmm. can't just say, "No, this is the limit." I know this is the limit. You just have to try the extremes all the time. Like, okay, this, it, it was nicer to make this longer. Yeah, then you have to try it even longer until you hit the limit and all these things. So yeah, we gone pretty nuts. And a lot of the times it's pretty nice to get after riding those bikes <laughs> <laughs> to have something that's actually working. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I can't, yeah, I can see some bikes and you're just like, oh, that looks completely weird like a 62 degree head angle on a trail bike and and all weird kind of settings it's it's super tough i think those bikes do you guys oh sorry i I think those those bikes like the really extreme ones the i don't know i see some of them on the trail and i'm sure you guys do too and in some areas that you just think they're working amazing but then yeah going back to like a bike like the spectral which is like versatility is literally the main objective as well as keeping this kind of poppy playful ride and um yeah being at the extreme really limits i think how versatile that bike is like so it's kind of yeah i think the well i've ridden it a bit li- like obviously <laughs> um yeah. limited authority on 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 how this bike rides but i i i found it's yeah it's progressive for sure but actually yeah the stays were still quite short and and being a little bit taller as well, but the 29 has still felt, yeah, same character as before. And yeah, kind of sits actually really nicely alongside the, the 27 inch bike. So, yeah. How tall are you? Jack? I am quite tall. I'm 194 centimeters. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. So you're obviously yeah. an extra large. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually like nice to ride a bike. It's a little bit longer this one than anything we've done before. And um, mm. yeah, I really, really like that actually. Yeah keep all the weight in the right place 100 percent. yeah i'm 188 so i'm not quite as tall um but yeah, yeah. well it 
I guess one thing that always worried me being a taller person and having that longer reach is shorter st- chain stays because it kind of makes it poppy. Did you guys try any longer chain stays and stuff? And, and what characteristics did it kind of give a bike? Yeah, I guess. <clears throat> so we've always had that setting on the sender since the first sender was launched in, I don't know, mm. 2016 or something. And yeah, for sure, there's a lot of people that are keen on longer chain stays and also like chain stay length that is uh, growing with frame size. Personally, yeah. I would rather have it that way to, <laughs> to shrink it for the smaller frame sizes because I, I, never, I never felt the benefit like overall to having longer. Ch- like obviously, if I go in a straight line over rough stuff, then yeah, it's gonna help you. But overall, to have a more fun bike, it's yeah, it's not for me. And I think like a lot of these trends now that it's starting to go overboard a little bit with geometry. It's not like the very best guys pushing for it, like Troy and Jack and and the guys, because mm-hmm. they are usually yeah, their geometry preferences would look pretty conservative in the pink bike comment section. And then, so usually the guys that are pulling really hard in that direction for super long, super long chain stays, crazies like Hedge of Angle are the guys that can for sure ride, but yeah, they're maybe not out doing sick whips and tables and everything, you know? So somehow it's like, yeah, of course it makes it easier to just, it makes it easier to go down a trail, but mm. is it actually a better bike that's more fun to ride? Uh, not so sure so that's kind of how i see the chain stay length thing a little bit yeah it makes it easier to ride in a straight line but if you're gonna go out and do some shapes on jumps or shrubs and berms it's yeah and so i kind of like to keep it a bit short in the rear yeah it's that's super interesting point it seems like there's a lot of companies that are making bikes easier for consumers to ride but if you actually ride the bike they're a little bit harder to have that more kind of conservative geo makes them almost a funner bike yeah that's also like some points ah it's a geometry it's a it's a deep hole <laughs> maybe we should get yeah. out of it but <laughs> yeah i think it's so easy people oversimplify it that's the thing like with people who aren't developing bikes they look into certain points that they really care about uh, and it makes sense in their head because they forget about the trade-offs and yeah. the other things that uh, affect other things. So it's easy to have your perfect world, uh, but it's not really the case. Also, people say you have to, every time you increase reach, you have to increase chain stay length to keep the weight balance. Yeah, that would be true if you stood straight up on top of the BB, but that's not the case. So if, <laughs> if you move the reach forward, yeah, then of course the center of gravity shifts as well away from the rear wheel. So the balance is also changing. So yeah, a lot of things to consider. So I think that's probably the most important thing when you're thinking about bikes in general, but maybe especially geometry. Same for me. Like you have to stay a little bit humble. No one has it all 100% figured out. You mean there's not a bike that can do it all? Like. That seems silly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it you can do it all, but it's, yeah, yeah, exactly. You can make it really good, but you can't have it the best at everything. That's why we have a sender and a Lux in the end, because you wouldn't wouldn't win the cross country World Cup on the sender, even if you're Matthew van der Poel. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> you could give it a go. I'd watch that. I'd also watch it. <laughs> so for sure, not try it. <laughs> Yeah. Ah. And, and everyone knows. Uh, that. Sorry. Sorry, continue. Nah, just like the bikes are really good for what they're intended for. But mm. yeah, there is no there is no perfect there is no perfect world or ideal scenario. It's just getting as close as possible. <laughs> and I guess like you mentioned the, the pink bike commenters and, and all the public as well. Uh, as as in your job, Jack, how how do you go about communicating everything that Leo is saying about the bike to the public in a way that kind of transfers easily to them? Um, maybe if I explain like what we did for this 
bike as far as yeah. the process and and like what where it went from yeah my first discussions with leo and and them shipping me a bike to have a little little ride mm. on through to producing i guess the press kit which you saw um last week so um we started off with like a well i started off riding the bike actually <laughs> and then um went into quite a lengthy q a <laughs> with leo yeah. which i think i think almost killed him like there was yeah i don't know <laughs> 25 30 questions leo that were kind of required some quite long answers but it was all kind of stuff like yeah why is this like this why is this like this and um actually i don't know if this is my first bike so i don't know if all the engineers will be like this i hope they will be but leo was actually really good i didn't really have to like interpret much of anything to be honest it all was pretty much exactly as Leo described is what is what we kind of yeah translated or maybe um, refined for for the customer facing communication um, and uh, and yeah kind of based it all off that so I, I quite liked that process and so my background before Canyon was I was um, a mechanic for one of the downhill teams um, okay, with sick. with Bernard and Elliot and I I really like like really like good bikes <laughs> and yeah. um and like authentic kind of you know it's if there's a marketing story it can't just be like from thin air it has to have like a basis in something and um mm. with this bike it was super easy because there were so many stories that were just from the development so yeah trying to retain the the spectral 27s character through to yeah all the effort from the redesign of the frame um yeah and and some of the other features which which made it onto the bike like adjustable geo and these kind of things there was so much there that actually yeah my life was quite easy when it came to putting together some some consumer facing messaging totally yeah so it yeah, starts the q a and then we kind of work through it um varying levels of kind of interpreting and translation um depending on the bike and depending on the the engineer but in this case was a really enjoyed it <laughs> so good project to work on is it hard to not go down like the marketing speak rabbit hole that you see some companies in most industries go down i mean it's hard to get away from words like poppy and but it's it's yeah. because that's the words that we use any like i don't know that's the word i use with my mates and stuff anyway so it's yeah, yeah. it's hard to move away from that stuff but actually I don't know, maybe I didn't use enough marketing lingo, but I kind of, yeah, would rather focus on the, yeah, the authentic, like, true stories behind the bike than try and spin something up, I think, yeah. So, mm. and... I think you pretty, yeah. you nailed it pretty well. I've read, I've read a few <laughs> press releases in my life and some of them you just come out wondering whether, like, you were just in Alice in Wonderland or something. Like, yeah, I have no idea what just happened. <laughs> so... <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I think, like... I guess for sure for us three, but also most of the the mountain biking community is so sick of all the three percent lighter blah 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 percent stiffer. Mm-hmm. Everyone is sick of it. That's why we got all these like funny like yeah launch videos now that kind of yeah makes a joke out of that a little bit. So mm-hmm. for sure for ourselves, but I think for the whole community, everyone just wants genuine stuff. That's why, yeah, companies like Transition, for example, are they're nailing like the product launch stuff because it's just genuine and true, and yeah, that's for sure how we want to do it as well. So, yeah, hundred percent, and it's getting harder because everything is literally five percent, one percent. Like that, the increments of change are so little now. Mm. Although we did a big step <laughs> up with this bike. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's got this some is a whole different case, but yeah. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. It's like there's so many times when I thought now, now we're in the end of end of this trend, and then it's like, oh, there was some way to go. <laughs> so I guess that's the biggest learning. That the only thing you know is that you don't know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because this was a two and a half year project for you guys, roughly. So the yeah. trends would have been. I mean, in the end, somehow the process always starts when the bike is launching. Like, because then you start getting all the initial feedback. And that's even if we don't officially have the project kick off the day after, that's somehow how it starts. But yeah, the development was about two and a half years. 
And since the other bike was on the market for pretty much exactly three years, I guess it's, mm. yeah, it's kind of a weird one that as soon as it hits the market and it's brand new for everyone, it starts being the old bike for, yeah, for it's us. A, yeah. <laughs> it's a bit, a bit of a trip, but yeah. I do remember Have actually you- in my, in my UK job, like we had uh, the Spectra 27 launch three years ago um and love the bike and everything really cool launch everyone's stoked on it and then it's yeah chat to like some of the product managers about it and <laughs> and they're almost like they're totally into it because it's obviously the launch of a bike but you can tell they're kind of thinking like what's next and <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah kind of absorbing all the feedback and and trying to think forward it's yeah interesting to observe for sure so yeah and to have a bike for two and a half years in today's world of mobile phones and, and everything like that how do you kind of keep it undercover <laughs> that was quite surprising for me yeah that was pretty sick with this one especially but yeah it was no leaks at all mm. and we've been riding it for one and a half years yeah so, right yeah <clears throat> the bike the bike you sent me leo had like i don't know who did it is it pete did all the like vinyl cover on it so you know like the like sometimes I think concept cars have that kind of dazzle yeah. Yeah. like shapes on the bike. So yeah, it kind of had this, like all the logos covered up with like black vinyl, but then yeah, they were kind of positioned. So it was kind of hard. To f- the tube shapes weren't super obvious. Um, mm. And I, yeah, I was riding it through, luckily it was lockdown. So there wasn't many people about, but was yeah, kind of true. rolling around my local trails <laughs> and uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> but I Not guess, no one asked so it's all good yeah i guess this like typical black and white automotive camouflage that's more like in bikes it's kind of just look at me we're riding a prototype please post (laughs) so for sure we mostly black them out when we ride and around here where we live uh people are kind of used to it i mean it's kind of like a i don't know gentleman's agreement that. Yeah, if you meet meet a friend on the trail, you're you're not gonna be awkward and just say, yeah. "Oh, later." <laughs> you can yeah. stop, and they're, then they're gonna know that there's something new. But yeah, it's not gonna it's be kind on of, Instagram. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like it's okay uh, if they see, it, but they're no, they won't post it and stuff. But when you go to when you go to the bike parks in the Alps or something, then it gets a bit trickier. So that's when you gotta be a bit stealthy, act natural. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's like the perfect way to put it because I remember seeing like because Troy came back and raced nationals in March on his 29er and was just riding it like it was his normal sender and no one noticed like if you just ride it and don't hide it it's it's almost better yeah but then you need to kind of hide it but without making it look like you're hiding it <laughs> yeah the full espionage yeah now most people yeah. are cool like most people who noticed that there's something new they they're not taking a spy shot and posting it online like some people just like say a nice comment like oh cool bike or yeah. they're nice like is it okay if we ask what it is and we're like sure you can ask what we we can say or whatever yeah. so most mountain <laughs> bikers are cool people after all so it works but some people are keen on getting the likes and comments so some stuff yeah. slips out the good old vital mountain bike forum. That, yeah, but that that's sick, awesome. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's, I think <laughs> it's, it's so a good. good thing. Yeah. Also, the occasional leak sometimes, like, as long as it's not too damaging or something too far ahead, is actually quite good for the hype around the bike. <laughs> <laughs> there is that. So. I don't know if you guys have read it, but there's like that conspiracy <laughs> brands leak that leak their photos like a week before the release on purpose to hype up the release of the bike. It's a full conspiracy. It's oh, good. sure that's happened. Yeah. <laughs> Leo is the one of the guys running that forum. No, I don't know. <laughs> nah. I mean, obviously this bike, didn't this bike didn't leak. This bike didn't leak. No, but also uh, if, you, if you think about like, yeah, what we did with the sender and other bike uh, or other companies also do with racing, especially like you have the guys running the new bikes before the launch because a most likely it's just better for the actual performance of the race but also 
yeah, it's not bad coverage to get. So, yeah. 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 Who kind of test rides the bikes at the initial phase? Because it's, from my understanding, that you straight to an and in this case, it's not it's not a race bike, so it's kind of makes it harder. How do you find test riders and who kind of prototypes them? So for sure, we ride a lot ourselves. That's a given, and I think it's pretty cool in our team now. Everyone is actually, or everyone are pretty good riders. I have to say, so that's pretty nice. Like not to hype myself up, but yeah all the guys from designers to engineers to product managers really can of course we're not professional riders but definitely on a level where you can tell all the differences we need to feel so starts out with ourselves but then yeah we have we have the athletes trying it because that's of course also important even down Mm -hmm. to and for a bike like this it's not just that uh yeah, Jack Moyer can win an Enduro. It's like the, the slope style guys and stuff are also riding it for sure to just uh, to have that side of it. And yeah, obviously we have Fabian, which is for R&D a huge help because he's going to tell you True. Yeah. exactly how it is. <laughs> <You're very bad. laughs> You're going to know. And yeah, he does one run and he knows pretty much exactly 90% of what he's going to say later. So, uh, yeah, yeah, we, we do a lot and yeah. Yeah. That level of experience with Fabian's pretty special thing to, to have, I guess. Yeah. So, yeah. and we also have like local good riders from around here. Who's been like, yeah, being really good on, on like a, a European level, but also rising, raising some world cups and stuff just to, uh, yeah try and wreck the stuff so if those guys have been running it for a year and it's not broken down it's usually (laughs) so yeah there's a lot going into it different aspects but yeah that was actually yeah i was wondering about that because troy's the one of the lightest riders in the world when he he goes fast but he don't i don't think he breaks that much stuff how do you how do you go with like damage testing and stuff like that do you find riders that just run through stuff as hard as possible or (laughs) Yeah, so I guess myself is not the lightest or smoothest rider. <laughs> yep. uh, but I don't know if you saw in the press kit, uh, Jacques, uh, the guy who rode the green bike on a lot of the photos. Uh, yeah, he used to, I think he was on the Bulls team at the same time as Win for a few years okay. even. Yep. Yeah, he's a super solid rider and he's from just around here. And he's... Yeah, same weight as me, over 90 kilos, and he likes to go hard. Like, mm. he jumps everything <laughs> to flat, and yeah, I think not many people put higher lateral forces in the bike than he does. So, yeah, we just have a few guys like this around here, which makes it really convenient because they can just go into the workshop and feed back to the mechanics themselves and and to, to us engineers. So, yeah, that's a big part of it, I guess. We also that's got it. up to some... Uh... <laughs> some unorthodox bearing testing as well in this bike so <laughs> we had yeah, we right. had like new we have like new bearing seals so i don't know if you remember on the the bike behind you actually you can see it right now um but we have those covers yeah. over the main the main pivot and it was kind of our yeah. first little like exploration into like double sealing pivot bearings and i think yeah. we're pretty stoked with the um yeah with how much durability increased but then you kind of have to take off those little covers to tighten up your pivot, strip the bike down. It's an extra three bolts. So mm-hmm. we kind of made it all a bit simpler. So the, the pivot bolts are directly accessed, but then yeah, in three years you can learn a lot. <laughs> um, and, uh, and frictions even less and, uh, and the durability of Leo, like you, you were telling me it's crazy. The, the times periods that we, that you punish the bike for. So. Yeah. Yeah. I had- when we when i was doing the briefing for jack for the launch now it was pretty funny when we got to this point because i kind of i, I kind of stopped in my tracks and was like wait i have to ask so i had to yeah I had to ask pete which are like head mechanic and i was like pete did we actually change any bearings on the spectral yet after yeah more than a year of riding and he he also had to stop and think and then we realized that we haven't destroyed any bearings on any spectral and obviously, 
So that's pretty sick, especially considering the conditions I'm going to head out in <laughs> now after the call. Like it's proper greasy here in Europe in the winter. And obviously we have to ride the bikes a lot and yeah, just pressure washing after every ride. And yeah, pretty sweet that the bearings aren't falling apart anymore. So also those kind of things. Yeah. Pays off for, for everyone, I think. hundred percent. I'm definitely going to say thank you for getting rid of those bearing covers because I have gorilla paws for hands and I've dropped them like 90 times already. So <laughs> yeah, I may or may not just be leaving mine off, but we won't go into that. <laughs> In Australia, though, it's okay, right? You don't. <laughs> no. You some... Nope. Because <laughs> the we get like this, there's a couple of tracks around here where we get this super, super lightweight, thin dust it gets in the bearing. And then as soon as you wash it, it becomes mud inside the bearings. So, ah, interesting. Okay. And there is a spot up north about four hours that we ride on and it's got volcanic ash and that's the same same type of problem. So it actually like seeps in dry. So yeah, you still gotta be kind of kind of careful. Respectful. Yeah. Interesting. Um, not, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think Leo yeah, I mean we did a ton of stuff. You saw the the press kit already there and like Leo, I I was super impressed at how the user friendly side of things. Like in the end, mm. yeah, we're we're bike riders, so that was definitely as well as making a bike that's sick to ride. Was making a bike that actually living with it is is good because if it's a pain, then you actually spend less time riding it and more time tinkering with it in the work stand. So yeah, we definitely wanted the bike to be something which you can use every day and and kind of yeah has good durability. And when it is time to work on it, you're not swearing at your allen keys and <laughs> yeah. searching for parts on the floor. So, yeah. Um, Don't have to remove your cranks and derailleur to do up a pivot bolt. Yep. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and you put those uh, replaceable, like, thread inserts onto those as well. Is that because people were actually stripping the threads in their frames? Like, how did that kind of come about? Actually, yes. And by people... It uh, was our World Cup mechanics. So on the, when we started the downhill, <laughs> uh, downhill race team, then Aaron and Nigel, they were kind of a little bit annoyed because they were used to breaking bikes before, like the yeah. other brands they worked with. And obviously that's pretty normal at the Downhill World Cup because it's mm. extreme abuse. And then when they got on the sender, they didn't break bikes from riding anymore. But yeah, so the only frames they broke was basically eventually when they stripped them down enough times, so the threads got kind of worn out or damaged. So they were like, this is so pointless. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's when all that discussion kind of started. So yeah, I guess they in yeah together with my colleague Moritz, who was the engineer for the for the, the new sender. They developed that system uh, for the sender, and yeah, we carried it over down to the Spectral now because we think it works super well, and it's yeah, yeah. just a great all-around feature. I'm sure Aaron guess said if it we... was because of that, but we all know he was just cross-threading him. <laughs> uh, I mean, they, <laughs> they, they strip the bike so many times, yeah. <laughs> and, and they, they're quick as well. Like, they don't have so much time to do it, so mm. uh, completely understandable. 100%. And even just from like a sustainability perspective, like, hey, you're not supposed to throw a carbon frame just because a thread is a little bit damaged. That's crazy. So, yeah, if you can just swap out the small aluminium part, that's pretty nice. Hey? I can imagine Leo's face, if, if one of his beautifully <laughs> engineered carbon <laughs> structure <laughs> frames gets binned. With it's just yeah like leo said it seems crazy so yeah trying to have all those i guess wearing parts replaceable and then yeah on top of that having the frame that's we're pretty confident how how durable it is and 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 yes should be able to put up with everything so yeah less less warranty less accidental damage less everything we hope with this one yeah yeah i think it's a really really cool idea i thought it was it was really cool for sure. I haven't seen it done anywhere else. So it's it really interesting. Yeah, I mean, I guess like replaceable 
stuff and yeah nuts in general has been done but i think especially with the the little bolt that holds it in place makes it yeah that much more mm. usable so it doesn't fall away like <laughs> the classic is when you have to do something quick on the bottom of the bike park and then your little thing drops down into the gravel <laughs> Yeah. And all, all yeah. that like stressing is just lost because you have to spend 10 minutes searching for it in the gravel. So, <laughs> yeah, I think it turned out really nice for the sender. And for sure, it's cool to be able to carry stuff over directly from the race mechanics down to to the more consumer products. Yeah. yeah. I've heard rumors those guys know what they're doing. So it's good to see they're actually uh, they're oh, getting their sure. advice through. <laughs> I think it's yeah. interesting like that like yeah i don't know i i always had this perception like when i first started mountain biking that world cup mechanics kind of have totally different needs to like me as like a 18 year old kid working on his bike in a car park like leo said but actually they're really similar needs when you think about it because they don't have much time to do it and they have to do everything Mm. like super well um and uh and it has to be like decent so as they kind of want exactly the same things that that we do from yeah i guess maintenance and and usability on the bike so yeah it's definitely good to reach out to them and one other thing i thought was quite cool um it actually comes from the sender is like i know a lot of brands are doing the profile chainstay protector like the rubber you know mm. waves on the chainstay protector whatever and um we have this guy in canyon um larry hartvik who yeah has been enduro mechanic for for years and years and works in our pro sports department and um he's always quite good for like coming up with with little mods and stuff for the bikes and um and he was like seeing all the profiles and then was making the chainstay protectors by hand with like the mastic tape um on uh, on the strides last year to try and get them as quiet as possible and then he kind of got the magic recipe (laughs) for for that (laughs) And then we actually, for the sender and for this bike, reached out to him and said, hey, like, how far apart are those knobs spaced? And, like, what height are they? And so that yeah. profile is pretty much directly from there, which, again, I just think is cool. And that's, again, like, you ask, like, so good. what we're doing with the marketing. It's like, well, it's kind of easy for us because there's all these kind of cool stories laced into the product. So, yeah. Yeah, that's really rad. <laughs> And you talk about like the the cool f- features and stuff, but it's also a very aesthetically pleasing bike. Like it's a really nice looking bike. How hard is it for you guys to balance like that functionality with the looks? I'm sure you could get a really good, good riding bike, but make it look terrible. And the opposite as well. Yeah. So it for me, it's actually easy because uh, Sebastian Hahn the the main designer in this project is a fucking genius. <laughs> it's it's been so cool working together with him and also like the the lead designers and stuff for the whole department because yeah those guys are of course writers themselves like they realize how important the performance and usability and everything is. Uh, but yeah, we just sit next to each other and there's what they know about design, just how you can make like even small things that won't even affect the performance just look that much better. It's, it's incredible. So yeah, but like you say, it's it, it, like in the end, it's a consumer product, so they have to look good, but they also have to perform good. So we just, yeah, work super tightly together in that phase of the project and just go back and forth, back and forth so many times until we find the, the perfect middle ground where the the performance complements the design and the design complements the performance and uh, yeah then we just fine tune the details together and i think yeah in general at canyon it turns out well but it's maybe especially in this project we got a pretty pretty neat looking package that's pretty well optimized too so yeah that's a super cool process also just for for the work to go through and it seems like uh, this year and this kind of era, like frame storage seems to be a big part as well. So we can see like the little pouch on yours out the back there. But were you ever thinking about doing any kind of in-frame storage options or is it just not a not a thing? No, for sure. We looked into it. We even had 
a fair few layup loops in this project uh, with it. Uh, so I, I, the frame wasn't decide, designed around it, but we, like even after we made the decision to not go with it because we didn't feel like it was worth it, the compromise, mm -hmm. uh, we still tried it in the R&D phase with this one. Uh, but yeah, so I usually like to ride with uh, just yeah tubeless uh, kit and and the CO two jack is completely mm. responsible, so he doesn't bring anything. <laughs> and some guys obviously go like full enduro and bring the whole workshop <laughs> with them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think it's like yeah, it's super yeah versatile. Just what different people want, such different things. So in the mm. end, we decided to to not make any compromises on the frame. So I run for sure as a dialed in frame. And then, mm. yeah, we have this uh, external version. So yeah, there is uh, the most essentials are covered somehow. Yeah. You don't need to take parts if you're, if you're not preparing to have issues. So it's, it's yeah. Cool. <laughs> also, I just ride like loam tracks about never more than two miles from the car park. So it's a weird kind of like network of trails near me. And uh, <laughs> I haven't carried a tube in like, I don't know, seven years or something. <laughs> so <laughs> just trust, trust tubeless way too much. And I sometimes take a multi-tool, but I don't know. Yeah, grossly irresponsible, but also maybe lucky for too long. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think it's, podcast, it might, gonna, <laughs> park on wheel. it might yeah. actually be a thing because before we started developing, yeah, just the external system for this bike, I also usually didn't bring anything when I just rode around here and I never had any flats or anything, but literally as soon as I like got the first samples for, for this bag and stuff, I've had so much punctures. <laughs> so I don't know if it's just because I brought the stuff, I started getting it or whatever, but yeah, <laughs> uh, it's pretty cool to be able to carry some of the essentials for sure. But yeah, for some other people, uh, having something like the specialized has is also really cool, of course, but yeah, for others it's kind of pointless. So mm. somewhere you have to make a decision and, and that's what we went for. Yeah, exactly. And I guess one of the last questions I have about the bike is you did the flip chip, which is your first one on a trail bike, technically, but then you had the uh, in the switch on the Strive as well. Was there a reason you went for the flip chip over the pneumatic switch on this one? Or Yeah, what definitely. Was... So, I mean, the difference to the Strive is that, I mean, the Strive is a it's the race bike it's supposed to be i mean it's fine if it's super high tech but it's just supposed to be performance whereas this spectral mm. is more of a fun everyday bike so yeah simplicity and just yeah make mm. it easy and solid is more important for the spectral so that's why we didn't go with the shapeshifter <clears throat> but the flip chip itself is yeah it mostly has to do with so the, the obviously the strive changes the geometry and yeah, bikes are getting slacker head tube angle and steeper seat tube angle, which is something that the shapeshifter has always done. But that's something we were kind of fine yeah. to have like, yeah, to make one setting kind of for the spectral because yeah, the slack head tube angle is super nice for going downhill, but doesn't mess it up for good climbing and the other way around for the seat tube angle. But Probably the main thing with the shapeshifter, I guess, is the height that you can raise the BB when you mm. need it. So for sure, for enduro racing, you got those hard sprints on some pretty rough terrain, which is maybe not what the <laughs> spectral is intended to do. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, in general, we're super keen on having like the low BB to just keep everything low and center of gravity down on our bikes. So we didn't want to compromise on that. But then again, there are guys like Braden who does gnarly climbs and yeah. really like that kind of stuff. So, of course, those guys yeah, can't just go around uh, striking their pedals all the time. So we wanted to, to offer that option to raise the BB a bit for the guys that like the technical climbing. So that's kind of the idea behind it. I think Braden's a whole different 
species of human, but <laughs> we're good down that route. Yeah, I guess he could do some pretty amazing stuff even without the flip chip, but I guess there are guys that like that kind of writing mm. with maybe not as much talent as he has. So <laughs> yeah, I guess if eight millimeters or so extra ground clearance can, can help out in that case. So. Yeah, mm. can be the, the difference between <laughs> cleaning it and being on the floor, eight mil for sure. Like just 100%. grazing a pedal on grazing a pedal on something or taking a good chunk out of it is yeah pretty uh 100%. a pretty big difference. <laughs> so whereas those eight millimeters aren't gonna help me anyway, so <laughs> I'm gonna try I'm just gonna try and get to the top so I can have fun on the downhill. That's exactly. what I do. Yeah. Hundred percent. Um it does adjust the angles by 0. 0.5 degree, but so I guess yeah. I tried it a little bit on the bike I had and you do feel it tighten up a little bit as far as the handling goes, but that may be the, the feel of the combination of higher BB. Um, but the, like Leo said, the main thing was to, to offer that little bit more pedal clearance. Um, yeah. So yeah, the guys, the sadists can kind of, yeah, stomp up <laughs> those technical climbs. Yeah. So Yeah. But the, the, I guess the angles kind of also pull it a bit more in this uh, climbing direction. So you get your body a bit more forward and, and everything so it's a little bit yeah technical climb mode without compromising too much of downhill performance for the guys that need it so mm. that's it 100 percent. see all right we might start wrapping things up so you can go for a ride and then continue with your day of work so i can go to sleep <laughs> <laughs> Man. um we'll wrap up with a few few questions uh first what's your favorite feature of the new the new spectral uh, Leo, first. You mean I have to choose between the geometry and the stiffness? <laughs> <laughs> or is neither of those features? <laughs> oh, they're features. Oh, okay, I gotta go with geometry. Hey. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it's like what asking a dad who his favorite child is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <a bit>, yeah. <laughs> I know how hard that you, was Jack? for Leo because I was going to say I know how hard <laughs> that was for Leo because the geometry was took a bit of work, but the frame stiffness took a ton of work. So okay. um, anyway, um, for me, I think we talked around it a lot, the geometry and stiffness and stuff, but one feature that I still really, really like is, um, but it's actually not a new feature for this bike, is um, you can buy ISCG tabs for this bike that slide mm. over the BB shell and they're replaceable. And I think cause my yeah, historically, I unfortunately had some, uh, damaged frames, not, not with Canyon dare I say, but, um, <laughs> where I've smoked guide on something and, uh, and that force has transitioned through to the ICG tabs in the frame. And I, mm. I just love that option that you can, you can fit it if you want it, like some chain ring protection. And if you do have an absolute mare, then, um, then, you're not going to damage the frame. You can just switch the plate out, switch a chain ring, switch the chain guide if you have a real big one. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, you're still rolling. So yeah, it's kind of like a little tweak, but I, I still really like that feature. <laughs> yeah, a little bit left field for you, but yeah. <laughs> no, I get it. I 100% get it. <laughs> but the geometry, that's not to say the geometry and stuff isn't sick. It is, but I just threw that, threw that one in there because I still think it's cool. So yeah. yeah. And what was the, the hardest feature for you to design? And then what was the like hardest thing to put into words or market for, for you, Jack? And what was the hardest thing to design for Leo? Let's start with Jack. Cause... Yeah. Um, I guess like if we talked around it loads today. That's probably why it's taken like 60 minutes. <laughs> but um, it's, it's trying to communicate that hey, this, is, this is our do everything trail bike um and for sure like leo said a lux or a sender is going to be better at either end of the scale but as a bike to kind of take everything on like we're super confident in in how this this bike performs and um mm. and try and explain i guess the reasoning why yeah, why you've got a flip chip why you've got the geometry we've got why we've got, gone down the storage route we've gone down it's it's all those things and just yeah trying to convey that to the customer and and mm. yeah and and sort of, I guess trying. I mean, then we're trying to convince them that this is a, this is a wicked bike to use for for loads of different stuff. Um, 
but yeah just putting that in simple terms is is always a challenge yeah so, and leo what was one of the hardest things for you to design uh yeah so i had to think a bit but i guess uh, actually the cable routing system was the the biggest challenge for me okay. because it's something uh, yeah it's something the system is completely new for us and especially mm-hmm. since we we went away from a system that a lot of people really liked it was kind of big pressure to perform <laughs> Because the the cable channel on the bike you have behind you is it's super nice just to have like semi integrated, but you don't have to open your brake lines to replace the brake or anything. Mm. Uh, so obviously we made a decision to go away from that, uh, but that meant we have to we had really had to make it easy still to work on. So we have yeah. the system now with uh, with tubes that go through the whole frame. Uh, but they're not mm-hmm. like they're not co-molded into the carbon or bonded or anything because then you can't yeah you can't achieve the connection between the front triangle and the rear triangle so everything is actually yeah. just assembled but then again just like these typical engineering areas that no one on the forums care about just like fitting <laughs> fitting a tube like this between the tire and the chain ring while still having a chain stay there like these kind of mm-hmm. things, not easy. And then to make the system yeah, dialed in so it works reliably and silently and yeah, actually makes the assembly easier is probably my biggest challenge. Yeah, mm. yeah 100%. But I definitely seen it messed up. <laughs> yeah, but I guess it was pretty funny when the, the production was starting to, yeah, right before the ramp up in our assembly factory here in Germany. I was up there to like, yeah, support for the first test assembly for the mm-hmm. like pre like the I don't know what you call it the ramp up mechanics up there like super experienced mechanics who really knows how to yeah just t- from assembling the bike once into helping the production engineers establish the whole production plan. And I was up there, and as with all those guys, they look super skeptical when they do everything, and then in the <laughs> end, in the end, he was like. So when is it launching? I want to buy it. And I was like, damn, that's a pretty good yeah. grid. <laughs> that's a pretty good grid. Yeah. It's pretty hard to impress any mechanic. <laughs> and then to do that to one of those guys must have been pretty pretty amazing. Yeah, exactly. But like our, our, like our R&D mechanics, they're part of the whole process. So they, they know where like the challenges are and yeah, how we overcome it together. Whereas those uh, production guys, they just expect it to be dialed so, mm. yeah, I was, I was pretty stoked that day. <laughs> if it's if it's not dialed then their life gets a whole lot harder <laughs> so there's a lot yeah, riding exactly. there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right guys so one last question i'll ask for this one there's usually a couple of extra ones but it's a bit easier if we just do the last one what kind of music do you guys listen to when you need to get like motivated for a ride or you're having a tough day in the office do you guys listen to any music or anything specific to kind of get motivated either one of you first it's the hardest question for some people you want to go jack it's hard because i don't have a specific one like i don't have a go-to tune and even a go-to genre it can just be anything like feel good tune so it could be something like an old school like jurassic five tune through to yeah good yeah something i don't know even older like rock like stones or yeah it it can be anything to be honest a little bit of snoop dog you just yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know like it just depends on the moment i think a little bit from my side and yeah kind yes. of not got a go-to unfortunately so sorry guys <laughs> yeah good. It's, a, it's for sure a tough question to <laughs> to answer and i guess normally you'd need another hour to <laughs> to cover it from my side <laughs> <laughs> I guess I guess if I would have to say one genre, I would have yeah, I'm quite into uh, uh, psychedelic rock, both the old okay. stuff and the new stuff, and that's also super wide. But yeah, kind of what you would see in BMX videos and stuff. That's yeah, good. Pretty much what I've grown up to, and yeah, that would be my go-to. Sick. Yeah, I don't think we've had I that one it- yet. 
any of those old like new world disorder soundtracks as well is kind of oh yeah <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> Do that remember, like some of those real iconic sections then it's hard if you're going out riding and you hear that it's not to feel a little bit of a buzz from it yeah yeah and reminisce about those those video sections so yeah there's actually i don't know if you follow snowboarding at all but there's a super cool snowboarding podcast called uh, and they have a section in every podcast which is named that video part so they just play a snippet from a song and the guests have to uh, say which video part is from and that's just so so telling because yeah i think i could probably name so many video parts from the songs from like the 05 to 2015 or something (laughs) Yeah, I almost play like the segment in my head when I'm listening to the song. Exactly. So that's almost super frame cool. for frame. Yeah. So good. Yeah, hundred percent. And whoever created like the playlists on Spotify for all the New World Disorders, you're a lord. That yeah. was, it's one of the best discoveries ever. <laughs> the real MVP. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> all right, guys. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll let you get back to work and get back to writing. So, but thanks so much for agreeing to do this. It's been a really fun chat. Yeah, for sure. Having Thank us you. On. Yeah, That's really appreciate right. it, and good to good to chat properly. And um, yeah, hopefully, yeah, the re- the listeners like it, and hopefully, you get you Darren gets you Daryl gets you a bike as well soon. I don't know if he's planning yeah. to. Is that your is that your bike there, or is that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, That's cool. My, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was, it's a good race. Cross not that. long. Awesome. Yeah, I literally Thanks got again. it a week before the release, so I was like, Darren should have just waited. But yeah, either way. <laughs> <laughs> all right guys well yeah thanks so much for that enjoy the rest of your day and um, yeah, you i'll too. let you know when this is out cool, cool. thanks Thank you guys cheers, cheers. Bye. Ciao. Bye.